we're one big family. And absolutely, uh, that to me is, 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 is something that we all instinctively know. Uh, it is absolutely just a remarkable feature and facet of our communities, our people, our province, and our country. Uh, this has been a terrible, terrible disaster. Uh, but I know this, um, as British Columbians and as Canadians, we stick together. I want to come out of this. I'm going to build a stronger, better province and a stronger and better country. A moment from B.C.'s Deputy Premier and Public Safety Minister Mike Farnworth just a short while ago as he praised all those who continue to come together in this time of need to help. Good evening and thanks for joining our special B.C. flood coverage. The mammoth recovery after the weekend storm is moving slowly. Tonight we begin our coverage with Belle Puri who tells us communities are far from out of danger. What was dry is wet again. Floodwaters are on the rise one more time in Abbotsford's Sumas Prairie. Ditches are filled with water. Vehicles have been abandoned. As long as this water comes in, these pumps cannot handle what's coming in. They can pump 500,000 gallons a minute, but that is nowhere near enough to empty this lake. At the same time, a slow exodus emerges from the devastation. Rigs rolled for the first time in days, rumbling down a westbound lane along Highway 7 between Hope and Agassiz. Commercial drivers stranded in Hope since Sunday finally made their way toward the lower mainland. The highway is now open to single lane alternating traffic for all vehicles. Overnight, an evacuation train rolled into Vancouver with more than 150 weary travelers on board. They'd been stranded in Hope since the weekend when mudslides and floods shut down the highway. The community is really coming together, boats and, and helicopter rides and, and just all that stuff, but the train is really, um, I just think it's a, it's like a godsend for a lot of these people. On Vancouver Island, repairs to Highway 1, the Malahat, have progressed well. No further overnight closures are needed. Drivers can expect single lane alternating traffic with some intermittent closures through the weekend. Repairs should be done by the end of Monday. The emergency response to this catastrophic flooding has generated an all-hands-on-deck effort. By end of day, it was estimated 120 Canadian Forces members would be on the ground in the hardest-hit areas. And it will range. Uh, it can be uh, helping in evacuations. It can be involved in logistics. It can be uh, operating equipment. Uh, it can be assisting, uh, for example, with, uh, with, with, with diking. Uh, and, and such like, uh, they will be deployed uh, where it is determined by the, the, the people on the ground uh, and to uh, where they're most needed. In Abbotsford, about 600 people have been forced to leave their homes. While some evacuation orders are lifting, many are still in place. But what we're going to be looking at doing is creating a levee where the high point is to bring in some blocks to to help contain the water and then look at utilizing part of the highway system itself because it's high ground there and the water isn't uh, necessarily up to the top that we can create a levee and it's going to be approximately 2.5 kilometers in length. Dairy and poultry farmers have already lost hundreds of millions of dollars in equipment and animals. Repairs to dikes and roads to make it safe here will cost even more. Before that work can begin, it could take weeks to pump out the water in flooded areas. And rain is in the forecast again. Bell Perry, CBC News, Vancouver. More specifically about the levy planned for Sumas Prairie, the city of Abbotsford will be speaking with homeowners tonight and tomorrow morning about potentially expropriating property, the private property. We know that levy will be about 2.5 kilometers long and the military will help to build it starting tomorrow morning. The goal really is to keep the water off of Highway 1 and they need to do that quickly. Now, the Canadian Armed Forces is also helping in other ways. At the day's end, we will have approximately 120 soldiers on the ground in Abbotsford, British Columbia. And if needed, we have thousands more members on standby ready to help the province and British Columbians. Soldiers on the ground will work to secure supply chains, run rescue operations and assist sandbagging efforts. Already more than 300 stranded motorists have been rescued by the Air Force using helicopters. 
Further inland, it could take a few days or several months to get some of our highways running at full capacity again. Let's bring in the CBC's Dan Burrett for more on BC's transportation system. Dan, what's it going to take to get things back to normal? Better weather, time and money to start, Anita. Let's begin with Highway 3. The province says it hopes to reopen that route right here by this weekend. The one route into the interior. Highway 1 in the Fraser Canyon, as we can see up here, Spence's Bridge. We know there was a washout there, badly damaged, particularly near the railway. Officials are working with the railway companies. They'll have a better idea on when they can reopen it, even a little in a few weeks. Highway 99 over here, the slide near Lillooet. That could be open to limited traffic in the coming days, but expect slowdowns. But the biggest challenge may be the Coquihalla Highway. It is destroyed in several sections. And staff say temporary repairs are going to take months. The message remains the same. If you do not have to travel, do not right now. In fact, the public safety minister says they're looking at restricting non-essential travel. And they'll share more about that tomorrow, Anita. Okay, Dan, let's shift to the agricultural disaster in the Fraser Valley. We know farmers and livestock have been hit incredibly hard. Lots of animals have died. What's being done for the farmers? Well, help on the ground and from the air right now. As we heard yesterday, as you mentioned, the province says thousands of animals have been killed in this flooding. Others have been trapped, some rescued. Many more will have to be put down. But those who have survived need food and water. The agriculture minister says they used helicopters to drop off massive containers to crippled and isolated farms and fill them with water. As for food? There was some feed that was at the, the port of Vancouver that was destined uh, to go to China. And it looks like we'll be able to reroute that back into the valley as needed. We've also had our neighbours in Washington reach out with uh, resources for us. And of course, um, all provinces across Canada are, are stepping up. And Another supply issue that people are worried about is gas. The province says if you don't need to fill up right now, do not. Supply has been disrupted in some areas we know, like near Victoria. The Transportation Minister says they're working with Trans Mountain and Alberta, among others. Yes, the message for today is cons conserve fuel wisely uh, and other materials uh, because there are interruptions in the supply chain uh, for a, a number of, of things that... Um, that are essential and uh, and that's an issue where uh, we're working with our federal counterparts and our American friends on uh, sourcing additional supply. Again, don't hit the road if you absolutely do not have to. Prepare for slowdowns and don't top up your gas if you really don't need it. Anita? Dan Burrett live tonight. Thanks, Dan. In response to the catastrophe, people are finding all kinds of ways to support their communities and their neighbours. So much so, donations are piling up. As Benit Breach reports from Abbotsford, food and household goods are needed, but it's important to know uh, where they can be used the most. Community members are determined to help their neighbours. Well, I wanted to donate some jackets and I have uh, undergarments and toques. But this evacuation centre is not accepting donations at this time. They're not taking donations because at this point they don't know exactly what each need of each family is. In the face of catastrophe, communities are pulling together. But the city of Abbotsford is asking that people check before dropping off donations and not take anything directly to evacuation centers. For now, food and household goods can be taken here. Archway Community Services on Essendine Avenue, it's open weekdays and is asking for bottled water as well as food, canned vegetables, fruit, legumes and meat, plus rice, pasta, cooking oil, as well as box meals like craft dinner and other non-perishables. MCC Clothing on South Fraser Way is open six days a week. It's taking clothes only and can't accept furniture. But MCC Thrift on Gladys Avenue is taking household goods like furniture and appliances. They are open limited hours Tuesday through Saturday. In the case of MCC, donations will be put out for sale. Evacuees will be given vouchers so they can choose exactly what they need. And before making a donation, it's still prudent to call ahead. Still, others are finding ways to donate time and put their unique skills to use. At Virgie's Fish and Grill, they're preparing hundreds of Indian meals to support evacuees, reaching out to farmers directly over social media to set up deliveries. I am a part of a community and many people helped when I was struggling for my career and my future. So it's my job to help if anybody needs. Others sourcing pet food to send to people who are evacuated and still stranded. 
I can't even imagine what the families are going through right now and it's the least that we can do is just to provide, you know, some food and supplies to get them through. Many people taking any opportunity to lessen the pain and loss of this catastrophic disaster. Benit Brach, CBC News, Abbotsford. As Benit said, people are always looking for ways to chip in, but whether in Abbotsford, Chilliwack, Merritt or elsewhere, if you want to help, Emergency BC has this advice. Unless a community has asked for specific goods, British Columbians who wish to help are asked to make a monetary donation to trusted organizations. Now, those organizations include the United Way, the Canadian Red Cross, and Food Banks BC. Well, the floods have caused widespread disruption across the province, and with many communities, they're now unable to get to the Lower Mainland. But as Susanna De Silva tells us, people are trying to figure out alternatives to minimize the impact of the disaster. I got water rushing out of the calf barn because it's coming in the back door so fast. Uncertainty now as waters recede in some areas, only to rise in others. You know, we're just barely above sea level here where we are, but you know, if it keeps coming, we could see another two feet of water coming in three feet quite easily over time. Yesterday, there was no water here. Today, it just keeps coming. Water coming from Abbotsford through dike breaches. The Bowmans have been dairy farmers on this property for 45 years. After seeing some flooding earlier in the week, things were improving, but they decided to evacuate their 500 dairy cows anyway. Now they're trying to save whatever equipment is left. They're worried about all the other farmers around them in the same or worse situation. As you guys saving yourselves, that, that's the biggest. The rising and shifting waters complicating things for everyone in the region impacted by what has happened. No, no, yeah. A weekend hockey tournament has turned into an almost week-long struggle to get home. It's kind of like a hotel purgatory. You know, we, we roam around the place. We That's kind of all we can do. We haven't really been flooded, nor can we go home, though. I haven't gone outside in a bit. Um, <laughs> So, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm not, we're kind of in the middle ground. The Howe Shorts live in Revelstoke, normally a five-hour drive, now inaccessible from the Lower Mainland. They can either take a 36-hour detour using ferries up the coast or a long detour through the U.S. Unfortunately, the kids were just having their new passports applied for, so we have no passports, and who travels, you know, to Chilliwack with a passport? Um, it's, it's far away, but not that far. Um, so I've been talking to the passport people and they've, they've forwarded the file um, so hopefully I can get kids passports. Without them, U.S. officials say only an enhanced driver's license will do. They're grateful not to be flooded but worry about their life including school that's on hold. I tend to get really nervous when I get behind um, and which makes catching up and being not as behind just so much harder because you're already stressed out and scrambling that by the time you get back and start trying to catch up, you're so stressed out that you can't focus on catching up. They're hoping their options and an actual timeline of when they can get home will become clearer when they make it to Vancouver. And it is the not knowing when the impacts of this disaster will be over that is one of the hardest parts to deal with. For now, everyone is trying to be grateful for what they do have. You know, that's uh, human life is the most important. We're safe. Anything else is stuff that can be replaced, you know, uh, over time. It's going to take time. We can just buy new stuff, build a new house, uh, renovate. Barns can be uh, fixed up. You know, that's just a matter of time. Uh, there'll be a cost. Of course, there's a cost. Uh, the main thing now is, you know, let's save ourselves, get out of here as much as we can take and move away and uh, to higher ground and hope for the best. Hope and pray for the best. And some 150 travelers stranded in Hope have now arrived in Vancouver after they boarded an overnight evacuation train. Via Rail stopped in Chilliwack, Abbotsford and Surrey before pulling into Vancouver at 2.30 this morning. Some passengers were international students who were returning from a sightseeing trip to the Rocky Mountains before they were stranded by the landslides. They went up to the Rockies on November 11th and then they were coming back and then on Sunday and then they got trapped between the two mudslides. And uh, yeah, so they've been staying in the shelter at the, at the high school for three nights and yeah, but seven nights all together, you know, and so today they were just exhausted. Emergency Management BC, Via Rail and CN coordinated the evacuation. 
Authorities have been urging people to stay calm across the Lower Mainland, but for some, that's easier said than done. People are understandably anxious with supply lines cut. They're worried about getting food, gas, even information. Renee Filipponi looks at what's being done to fix that. A calm day here, a far cry from the crashing water that washed this barge ashore earlier this week. This is the cause of our actions as such, right? So we have to rethink how we respect the environment. The crisis is prompting people to prepare. Abda Mahmoud packed emergency kits for her children's cars this week. With many major roads cut off, there are supply issues across the province, from gas stations to grocery stores. Well, we've been here four hours and uh, now they discover that the tanks are dry. So we're just sucking the last couple of dollars left. In the Fraser Valley today, some essential trucks were able to make it to Chilliwack, but still problems remain. You know, we don't have a lot of groceries. We're running out of water. We have the fear of not just the flood, but electricity, um, medications for many. The province hopes to open more roads in the coming days. The Coquihalla will take much longer. Uh, we're doing what we can, everything we can, uh, to reestablish transportation links uh, around the province. And today, Ottawa said more help is coming, including 120 soldiers right away, with hundreds more available. It'll provide help to vulnerable, stranded and in distress people. And it will include personnel to mitigate the effects of the floods, which include the protection of critical infrastructure, it's been a year of climate catastrophe in B.C. First the heat dome and fires, and now mass flooding. Amid it all, there was good news for hundreds trapped in hope who arrived in Vancouver by train. Basically just kind of let it go, let, let go with the flow. <laughs> That's all you can do, really, in, that, in our situation. It's that sense that things are out of their hands that is echoed by so many who have lost their homes, are cut off from loved ones, and worried about what's next. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. And sticking with that talk of supply, like Renee mentioned, empty store shelves in Kelowna, Hope, even Metro Vancouver are fueling angst among shoppers. Provincial leaders are pleading with everyone not to hoard goods and food. They're assuring us there is enough to go around. But as John Hernandez tells us, many are calling on the province to come up with a food security plan. It's deja vu in the grocery store. Rows of empty shelves, a sight not seen since the start of the pandemic. Flood-induced panic buying taking hold. And I was devastated to see there was no bread, no meat, and you could not find any green product, uh, meaning any produce or fruit, not even one apple or a banana or a potato. This grocery store owner in Kelowna says his shelves have also been hit hard. So much so, he's flying in supplies from Calgary. It was very expensive, but then that's given. We, you know, the video is I did not raise any prices. We bear that cost uh, upon ourselves. And it's not just in the Okanagan. These photos taken inside a superstore in North Vancouver. Please do not hoard items. What you need, your neighbors need as well. Provincial officials say they're trying to get supply chain routes back online as major arteries, including Highway 1 and the Coquihalla, could take weeks to restore. The province says there won't be shortages. Still, some food security experts are calling this disaster a wake-up call. We are only nine meals away from anarchy. And the thing is, BC food security is vulnerable even before the disaster. Food researcher Tamara Soma says while community members have stepped up to feed food insecure residents, the province needs to come up with a better plan in the event of future disasters. Natural disasters are not just going to magically stop. Um, and we are more connected, we are more dependent on these complex food supply chains, so we need to really invest in and strengthen the local food infrastructure. That might mean filling up warehouses with months of emergency food supplies in strategic locations, something some grocers, like Fruity Canna, have already taken upon themselves. So we in this food industry had to be ready for all that, and the government has to come up with a plan as well, what to do in our food sector in case of disaster like earthquake. And while it's never a bad idea to have emergency supplies at home, experts say panic buying things like produce, meat and milk ultimately leads to more waste. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver.
Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. And Joe, all that rain, record rain, has actually altered the geography of the land around us. Can you explain what's happened? Yeah, Anita, incredibly, as water levels recede, we're uh, really getting an insight into how much power came through our rivers, uh, starting with the cold water river that runs from the Cascades alongside the Coquihalla into Merritt. And today, officials discovered that that river has carved a new course. It has jumped a block west and now runs permanently through Pine Street, uh, running north through Pine Street before reconnecting with the Nicola River. Uh, there are homes and businesses along this river, and it actually also cuts the public workyard uh, in half. So officials are going to have to figure out uh, what pipes are now underneath the new course of this river. Uh, but officials say they're not going to reroute it. Uh, this was the location of some of the highest rainfall totals. And I was talking to an expert uh, earlier today in landslide hazards uh, who was saying that preliminary numbers show that uh, the cold water river uh, took in more water than it ever has in the history of this river. And we have records going back 100 years. Just before the gauge uh, Monday morning, uh, the water levels are moving through at about two and a half cubic square meters. Uh, to put that into perspective, at the height of this atmospheric river event, two and a half square meters became 400. And that's what charted a new course. Uh, earlier today, we spoke to Greg Lois, the information officer uh, from the city of Merritt, about uh, what to do with this new river. Take a listen. Um, it's entirely possible that we're simply going to have to learn to live with the fact that the river is now in a different place than it once was. Uh, the river has jumped its old banks, it has carved its new course, and the river really does uh, exist where it wants to be. And that might not always be where it's convenient for us. So it would be, as he said, a feat of engineering to reroute that river. No plans at this point, but uh, this is this is all just revealing itself in the past uh, few hours, Anita. So uh, engineers, along with all of the infrastructure that will be examined, uh, this new river and this new course through a street in Merritt uh, will be part of the uh, recovery plan. And we may end up seeing other rivers uh, that have done the same thing. This is not uncommon with huge rain events like this higher up in the mountains just haven't seen it uh, in, a, in a city like Merritt uh, it, ever before. Wow, okay, thank you, Joe. You're welcome. We know thousands of farm animals have died in Abbotsford because of the floods. For days, round the clock, farmers and community members have worked to guide as many as they can to safety. But there are cows and other animals still left on the Sumas Prairie. Joining me now is Holger Switzenberg, head of the BC Dairy Farmers Association. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for reaching out. Holger, we've seen images of the convoys of tractors carrying water, driving through the floodplains, trying to get to the animals today. Can you tell us about those efforts? What's gone on? So a lot of the animals were successfully removed from the Sumas prairies, but those that weren't, today now they need water and feed, and the farmers are doing their best to get to them on roads that are still yeah, covered in water, and it's difficult to see where you're going. But they need water, health, clean water. So once the tractors with this water actually get onto the farms, what's the process like? What are they doing? Well, they, yeah, then you fill up the water troughs as best you can. And knowing that a full-grown dairy cow can drink up to 100 litres of water a day, they need a lot of fresh water for their herds. So have they been able to get enough out there today? I can't comment on that. I'm, I'm a little bit further east in Agassiz with my uh, with the evacuation the evacuation cows that we have i'm not privy to what's happening there today exactly i just know the efforts are being made today to get them feed and water to get them the water first and then some feed it's been two days and you just talked about those evacuation cows that you're housing you have some on your farm and many of the cows have gone to other farms do we know how many yeah, it's got to it's it's got to be in the thousands i mean 59 farms were given evacuation orders I mean, I've got 30, my friend Tom's got 70, another friend of mine, Jeremy. Yeah, they're, they're spread out all over Chilliwack and Agassiz. What do dairy farmers need the most right now from people, from the province? I think the first thing is we need, we need, to, get, we need to get water and animals that are still in the affected areas. That's our first step. And then probably next would be to make sure that we've got some sort of feed supply for the uh, for the poultry industry and for us, 
And I think what's important too is that we recognize we're, we have to do this one step at a time. I mean, it's an ongoing situation evolving all the time and you know, we're not really sure what's next. And the water right now is still there. Are you concerned with the water still being there that more animals could die? Yeah, we're doing our best to take care of the ones that are there. I, I hope we can save as many as we can. And yeah, it's, it's a heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching decision sometimes, but we're doing our best to save the ones that are still there. What have you noticed about the community coming together and about all these farmers helping each other? Well, it's, it's, it's amazing to be part of that, how you know, everyone dropped what they were doing. They mobilized their barns, they made room, they hopped in their pickup trucks, they got trailers. And I mean, they started hauling those animals out as fast as they could. They dropped them off at a farm in Agassiz or Chilliwack. And then they turned around and went and got more till it got too dark. It was, it was it's an amazing, amazing show of community spirit to try and help those affected. Holger Switchenberg, head of the BC Dairy Farmers Association, thank you. You're welcome. And again, thank you for reaching out. A large explosion has injured 10 people at CFB Comox on the island. What happened and why? Coming up. Thank you for staying with us during our television commercial break. Uh, last night during this first break, we showed you some footage of some of the damage done to BC's highways from the extreme rainstorm that hit earlier this week. And tonight we're going to show you more of the harrowing video and images captured over the past few days. Have a look.
At least 10 people are hurt, one seriously at a Canadian Forces base in Comox on Vancouver Island. The blast happened around 9 a.m. at an unused building. BC Emergency Health Services says six patients were treated at the military base's medical unit. Four people were taken to hospital, three in stable condition and one critical. Military officials have yet to say what caused the explosion. The blast happened some distance from where the base's aircraft are situated and there was no damage to any of the the airfield's facilities. Turning to BC's fight against COVID-19 now, Northern Health is maintaining its regional health order as infection rates strain hospital resources. It comes as the province reports 468 new cases today, most of them coming in Fraser Health. Since yesterday, nine more people have died, bringing our total number of deaths to just under 2,300. Health Canada will approve a COVID-19 vaccine for children as young as five years old tomorrow. It will be for a vaccine from Pfizer-BioNTech. And as David Cochran reports, the supply could arrive within days. In the U.S., kids between the ages of 5 and 11 have been lining up and rolling up their sleeves for weeks. More than 2.5 million have had their first shot of Pfizer so far, something that will soon happen in Canada. Just knowing that it's here now is, is really exciting. Well, what if we have sun on one side? Misty Pratt spoke to CBC News last summer about the impact the pandemic was having on her family. Since then, her 12-year-old daughter, Aylin, is fully vaccinated. Her 9-year-old, Emily, will be as soon as she can. It's just been that anxious sort of waiting of, you know, is something going to happen? Is a case going to come up? And now knowing that we can protect her makes us feel a lot better. Children under 12 continues to have the highest incidence rates across all age groups. Friday's formal approval will come one week after this warning from Dr. Teresa Tam. With more than 85% of Canadians over 12 fully vaccinated, younger children are the last unprotected group. And I can promise you we are ready. As soon as we receive the 5 to 11-year-old supply from the federal government, our public health units and local partners are ready to receive and administer the Pfizer vaccine. Federal officials are working with Pfizer to lock down a firm delivery schedule. The Prime Minister has said that 2.9 million doses will be shipped to Canada shortly after approval, and sources say that will likely happen next week. Then it's up to provinces to get those doses in arms. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is now meeting with his counterparts from the U.S. and Mexico and Washington, D.C. Trudeau headed into the discussions with several concerns. As Ashley Burke reports, top among them is one of U.S. President Joe Biden's signature policies, a plan involving electric vehicles. Side by side, but still far apart on some key issues. Well, it's great to welcome back the Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Joe. It's, uh, it's been a busy year. U.S. President Joe Biden meeting in the Oval Office today with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. A dispute over the auto sector threatening to become a major sticking point. But there's a lot of complicating factors. Trudeau trying to persuade Biden to change course on his plan to give tax incentives to those who buy electric vehicles made in the U.S. Canada's auto industry says it could throw the sector into turmoil and is worse than anything Donald Trump ever proposed. The answer is I don't know, and I don't know what we're going to be dealing with, quite frankly, when it comes out of legislation, so we'll talk about it then. Biden making no promises. I still get an Canada's looking to Mexico for support on this issue. Lots of great things to talk about, lots of things we agree and align on. Muy buena relación. We are countries that collaborate and yes, cooperate. Exactly. A source says Canadian ministers also met with members of the Biden administration last night at the home of Canada's ambassador, where they pressed the same message Trudeau gave congressional leaders earlier in the day, calling the tax credit a clear violation of the new NAFTA agreement. He sort of said, guys, like, we all spent a lot of time negotiating this agreement, so do you really 
want to violate it in such a significant way so soon after its passage. We don't view it that way. Uh, I think it's safe to say. Uh, I would say that in our view, uh, Armour, the, uh, the uh, electric vehicle tax credits is uh, an opportunity to help consumers in this country. But Canada says if this American measure goes ahead as is, it could become the dominant issue in the Canada-U.S. relationship. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Washington. The RCMP has cleared a blockade by a First Nations community in northern B.C. Coastal GasLink says Mounties removed structures that had stranded some 500 pipeline workers just west of Houston since Sunday. And as Jorge Barrera tells us, this isn't the first time clashes have erupted. Roads closed. Roads closed. We are here to conduct work on behalf of the Coastal GasLink project, and you're impeding us. Another confrontation ignited on a familiar battleground. Wet sowed and members put up barricades late last weekend, and hereditary chief Woos ordered pipeline workers off his territory. A total of 20 hours was given to CGL to vacate the camp. The barricades have cut off supplies to 500 workers on Coastal Gas Link's project site and violated a 2019 court injunction, making it illegal to obstruct the forestry road. Today, the RCMP moved in to enforce that injunction for the third time in as many years. This was the first raid in 2019. CBC News obtained never-before-aired footage, revealing the intensity and breadth of the conflict that has flared once again. Yeah, two subjects working their way westbound to, to each pile. In 2019, Molly Wickham was singled out by police. Who do you want next? I want Molly. Okay, good. Yeah. All right, next is Molly. As RCMP moved in today, Wickham took to social media to rally support. They are trespassing. We need you to shut shit down everywhere that you can. Not everyone agrees. The Coastal Gasling Project has signed deals with 21st Nation elected band councils, including from the Wet'suwet'en Nation. The elected chief of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation issued a statement saying it was the actions of a few members who do not represent the collective views of most Wet'suwet'en people. The statement urged them to step down peacefully and immediately. Our Wet'suwet'en law is what we live by. It's everything that matters to us. As of this evening, Coastal Gas Link says the main road is clear, but Wickham and others continue to occupy a nearby site, preparing to hold on until the end. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Ottawa. An Indigenous community cut off. We meet the people working night and day to bring in vital supplies. That's next. Good evening. In British Columbia tonight, dozens of communities in the Fraser Valley are cut off after more than 17 centimeters of rain flooded major highways. Basements are underwater and many people have had to leave their homes as floodwaters continue to rise. The Chilliwack River has risen more than two and a half meters and flooded parts of the Fraser Valley. Summer cottages on Hatsik Island were evacuated as the water rose. Residents in some communities along the river had to leave and farmers are moving their animals to higher ground. 200 cows in the barn that we have to take out milk cows that are up to three feet of water. Officials say it's only a matter of time before phone and power lines are knocked out along some of the roads. One rail bridge has already been washed out and highways in the lower mainland, including the Trans-Canada, are flooded. Across the border in Washington state, the town of Sumas is virtually underwater. Thousands of people have had to leave their homes and the National Guard has been called in to help out. The border crossing between Canada and the U.S. is closed. More rain is expected. Well, the water isn't rising anymore in British Columbia, but in the southwest and parts of Vancouver Island, it's time to clean up. As we hear from Ian Hanamansing, many people who were up to their knees in water are now up to their necks in work. Class was out in Sayward today for students at this elementary school. Sunday night's flash flood soaked just about everything, and today it was a mess. How do you drive this? How do you go ahead and drive it? It will take a lot of work to get things ready for classes again. Today, teachers tried to be optimistic. They were fortunate that these, uh, the larger desks, of course, the water didn't quite get into the uh, door yeah. work. 
Throughout British Columbia, it was a day for people affected by the flood to catch their breath. In the Fraser Valley, water levels dropped quite a bit, even though it was still pretty wet. Joan Weston's house has been surrounded by water since Saturday, making what used to be simple chores like walking the dogs a lot tougher. You have to get your hip waders on and uh, take them out to the bo in the boat at 3 or 4 in the morning to go to the bathroom. It's good. Inconvenient, maybe, but Weston is resigned to live with it. There's nothing to do. Nothing at all you can do here. Um, as fast as you can pump it out, it'll pump back in again. Some people still haven't been able to move back to their homes, and the frustration for them is starting to show. You know, without losing their shirt over it, if we could sell our place and move, we'll definitely be doing it. There's no doubt in my mind. But for now, Jeff Warner and his wife want to get back to their home. And like so many people affected by this flood, all they can do is sit back and wait for things to dry out. Ian Hanamancing, CBC News, Hatsik Lake, British Columbia. Reaches is pushing our way instead of going toward the Barrowtown pumps. That's the problem. Yeah, you know, I've gone from laughing and crying every couple hours for the last few days because you just don't know what to do sometimes. Yeah, I know. It's, it's just, you know, your cows are out, they're safe. That's what matters, Kevin. You know, your family, get them out, stay safe. Don't, you know, if your furnace, I know you don't want to lose your furnace and stuff, but. If it matters, you guys saving yourselves, that, that's the biggest. If, if you can, if wagons are willing, just get it out, get it to your animals. It's better to have the feed than not. We don't know how long we're going to be out. A real moment of what's been going on in the Fraser Valley as farmers and community members struggle to handle the situation. Now to the situation in the interior where roads and bridges have been wiped out and major routes closed. The New Eich First Nation west of Merritt has been completely cut off. Today, Aaron Collins visited the remote site where crews have been working around the clock. Their goal is to build a bridge and to get vital supplies to those who need them. There's just two ways into the Nuwayich Band's land. Both bridges, both washed out. That means band members and other residents in this area are stranded. No power, no drinking water, little heat, little to do but wait. With no power, all our freezers can't run. We don't have lights at nighttime. And we can't cook, we got no hot water. So it's pretty stressful. The work is underway to change that in a hurry. No easy task. You can usually walk across this creek. Not anymore. It went from 10 meters across to more than 60 overnight. By the time we got told to leave here, evacuate, the bridges were out. I've never seen it like this, and I'm almost 70 years old. These crews are working around the clock to rebuild this crossing, building it out to meet the changing landscape. They've been working on the nearby Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, but when the floodwaters hit, they quickly switched gears. A lot of these people, I know most of them, and uh, they know us, and we're really not going to leave here tonight until they can drive across. To get the job done, workers from throughout the area are pitching in, including some from the neighboring Lower Nicola First Nation. We all need to kind of lean on each other right now, and other communities are supporting uh, other communities and helping them out. Being First Nation is uh, it's a tough goal right now. Until the work is done, the people here can do little more than watch, wait, and try to keep warm. I'm fortunate enough that I've got a wood heater and a generator. The hope is to have the crossing here completed and people moving at some point tonight. It's going to take much longer to get this area back to anything even resembling normal. Aaron Collins, CBC News near the Nuiich First Nation.
This disaster is not just about displaced people. As we've seen already tonight, thousands of farm animals have died and many more are in danger. Katie Nicholson is giving us a deeper look at the impact on agriculture. Hoping to get across to see his property, today Gord Calvert will have to settle for a hug. While his home and the farms that neighbor it are underwater, he's grateful because it could have been so much worse. There were 300 people who sandbagged at the barrel camp pump station. They, sorry, they literally saved the prairie. So thank you to all those people. This area is a major dairy hub for the province. Abbotsford's mayor acknowledges when the waters recede, the full impact will be revealed. There's going to be uh, dead livestock and uh, dead chickens. Thousands of animals are believed dead, but the Dairy Association says it's too early to assess the full scope of the financial loss and the loss of animal life. I can't imagine what it would be like to see your farm, something that you've worked at your whole life, all of a sudden with six feet of water, potentially having to leave the premises with the evacuation order, having to leave your animals behind. And for the surviving cattle, another challenge. Waterlocked roads mean no way for feed to get in, something the federal government says it's working on. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency is working with industry to support the humane and safe transport of animals and to ensure the availability of livestock feed. And yet, from these grim realities, moments of gratitude and generosity. And the water just came so fast across the prairie. It was, it was insane. It was scary. It was actually scary. Denise de Jong's Abbotsford farm is completely underwater, but her horses are safe, high and dry on a Langley farm, thanks to the kindness of others. There's many people that offered to take our horses, of course. Uh, but to have all eight of them in one spot, it just, it means the world to me. I, I can't even start to think of how I'm going to thank these people for taking us in. At 646, a live look at a snowy rebel stoke tonight. If you were caught on the mountain passes in a snowstorm, would you be ready? What should be in your travel emergency kit and what you should be ready for after the break? My hot take on baking is that I don't really like icing. Maybe I haven't found an icing that I like, but I'd rather have cake without icing. <laughs> I have a personal vendetta against American buttercream. It's disgusting. It is so sweet. Like you literally take a bite and you've got diabetes. Like that's it, that's a wrap. So anything disgustingly sweet, I don't enjoy. I hate macarons. I do not like them, they are too sweet. They are so finicky and such a pain in the behind to make that I, I can't stand them. I don't like macarons. And I know that every time I say that, people give me a weird look. They're pretty. I don't, I don't think that's, I think that's all that's going for them, they're pretty. <laughs> the most overrated baked good for me is macaron. I just, I don't get it. I don't get all the hype, all the excitement. Maybe macarons? I'm just like, meh. Like they're just almond cookies with, with a little bit of filling. Pumpkin spice, anything, is also overrated. <laughs> My controversial opinion, please don't hate me, internet. I don't like sourdough. Like why would you eat sour bread when you can eat sweet, not sour bread? Like what is a sour adding to a bread? It just seems like it's gone bad. I don't use a scale when I bake, which seems to be the common thread for everyone. Everyone uses a scale, I don't. I use a good old fashioned cup. I don't like brownies. The raw cake, it's gross, it's gooey. Like the brownie needs to go. I don't think there's anything really overrated, to be honest. I think everything has, has its own um, reason to be there, like all of us. We're all here for a reason and, you know, like it or lump it. We're not for everybody, but we're for somebody. Even at three months, the cubs have distinct personalities. Yeah, you know, I'm watching these little guys and I see, see one of them is, is being a bit of a brat. The male 
is cautious and stays close to his mom. His sister is reckless, putting her at risk in such a dangerous world. Each bear's an individual. Each one has a, their own character. Each bear shows you that he's different from the other bear. For the next two years, mom will be their sole protector and will teach them how to hunt. Over the past week, hundreds of people have found themselves stranded in their cars, stuck on the side of the road in treacherous conditions, sometimes for days before help could reach them. As the CBC's Michelle Gassoub reports, it's a stark reminder that more than ever, it's crucial to be prepared when traveling on BC roads. When Luke Gleason became stranded in hope, he was prepared with enough food and water in his car. But that wasn't the case for everyone who became stranded know who, who who's prepared when you see the people in the park they've got like their whole little barbecue set up and they're doing their little thing and then other people are you know they have bottles outside of their windows trying to like collect rainwater hundreds of people were trapped on the highway in their cars some for 48 hours or longer before help could reach them people don't expect bad things to happen Mark Milner with ICBC says it's a reminder to always be prepared before traveling on BC highways. Uh, an old sleeping bag or a blanket or something like that can be really handy if you're stuck for a long time on the road in, say, the mountains. It's also important to always dress for the weather, have sturdy shoes in case you need to get out of your car, and bring enough non-perishable food items and water for everyone in your car. And don't forget a can opener. Your emergency kit should also have items like a flashlight, wind-up radio and jumper cables, enough supplies to keep you warm and fed, and only get out of the vehicle if you're sure it's safe. And keep in mind, in remote areas, it can take hours and even days before you get help. You're never really ready for an event, but it always helps there to make sure that you actually, uh, you know, if, if you're traveling 12 hours down the road, that you uh, are ready if you're ever stuck someplace or if you need to make a fire, do whatever it is you got to do. Well, the likelihood that these kinds of things are going to happen more often uh, with the climate changing. So it's just a good idea for people to, to try and prepare as much as possible. The events of this week, a reminder that BC highways can prove treacherous and extreme weather likely to only become more common. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. Joe, I feel like if anyone is prepared with a go bag, it's got to be you. Yeah, Anita, I was just thinking, uh, listening to uh, Michelle there, I mean, it's all the same essentials for your earthquake kit. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, now is uh, the, the right time to get things ready. And uh, it serves its purpose for all disasters, uh, as Michelle mentioned, especially those as we continue to move into a warming climate. Uh, just to change direction for a moment, you know, I almost forgot until our producer reminded me that tonight is actually a lunar eclipse and in fact it's going to be the longest lunar eclipse event in about 600 years and i think these showers will clear uh, across metro vancouver uh between 10 p.m and 4 a.m that's how long this event lasts in its duration but the lunar part uh where the moon will turn that reddish color uh about four hours so a long event uh, probably the best time to view around 1 a.m and i also think that's when skies were clear let me take you to the satellite and radar right now. Uh, things are clearing. We've got showers, very minor showers lingering for the North Shore. Luckily, they have ended uh, Abbotsford eastward. Uh, so just getting that uh, minor rainfall through today. Obviously, cold rain, not what anyone needs, but uh, uh, lower amounts. Uh, as I take you through the next 24 hours, not looking at anything significant. In fact, blue sky back for Friday. 
a few showers on Saturday. Anita, it's Monday night into Tuesday that we'll watch for the next significant rainfall event. Next week is going to be wet. I'll continue to uh, hone those forecast numbers over the next couple of days. Okay, definitely hoping it doesn't make things worse. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Among the stranded, a new mom and her premature baby boy discharged from hospital only to find themselves caught in the aftermath of the storm. That story is next. Prices uh, have been hiked, you know, even like uh, perishable materials, you know, non-perishables. Even the gas prices went up really sky high. I mean, like, it's really, really not affordable at this time. I was uh, introduced uh, this place by my friend, like, wherein you can get the food uh, for the little cheaper prices compared to, like, other places. When I get something that's nice and cheap, I love it. I feel good that I'm giving people cheap produce to feed their family. Produce has a short life, and some of sometimes there's too much of it. So people, shippers or people that produce or farmers, they have two choices: either they move it cheap and get some money for it, or dump it and pay money to dump. So we jump on these opportunities where there's access product that we could buy cheap and offer to our customer cheap. Our main goal is to aim both of those categories, right? The higher end and the people who look after the budget. So for the quality, like it's still usable, we can still sell it a little bit cheaper prices than the regular prices, but you can use it. What we do in here, we're sealing and packaging lemongrass. Today we got some nice banana, jumbo, honeydew, yellow on the outside, and sweet on the inside. A green thigh chili, and an orange. 80% of our produce, or 85%, number one, we buy it direct from farmers, shippers out of California, Arizona, Mexico and all these onions you see there, that's from Alberta, right? This is the small, small onion. There's no big demand for them in the commercial market. So we get it cheap and there's nothing wrong with it. We have to budget trying to be a little bit more cautious. Actually, we started to, to do shopping here three or four years ago. I think that is cheaper. But sometimes maybe the quality is not as great as co-op or super store. You have to make that judgment when you buy the produce. You look at it, this is good for one day, two days, it's cheap, I could use it. I mean, produce doesn't last forever, right? You have to make that judgment. We have number one, number two, all that kind of stuff. We talk to so many different suppliers and we see, okay, we shop around. We see where we're getting the product cheaper and with quality, so we try to, you know, um, go different, different uh, suppliers. So I think this is the main reason we can get uh, cheaper prices and local, affordable, right? So this is, I think, the main reason people are shifting from big chain store to independent stores. A new mom has found herself stranded in Langley with the newest member of her family. Her son Jackson, born two months premature, was finally discharged from the NICU this week. But as they were returning home to Chilliwack from Surrey, disaster prevented them from taking their son home. She spoke with the CBC's John Northcott earlier today. Um, little action Jackson and the flood is what his nickname is now going to be. I couldn't be happier with how he's been. I don't think he knows any different from how crazy his little life has been from the start. It's just it's just the normal for him, I think, sleeping in a drawer in a hotel. I don't know what to think. Is Do I just take it as a vacation from home for a little bit because we're stuck and there's nothing we can do? 
or do I take it as a what the heck is going on in 2021 we've had a crazy enough past two years can't we just have a break for a little bit when Jackson's old enough to understand what it, he went through, uh, not only his birth, but the in hospital and then getting stuck in the hotel room, what, what are you going to tell him? Um, that he made his mom have gray hairs at 22 years old. And <laughs> that, exactly, we, we did just get through. We made through with whatever we had. And I couldn't be happier with how he has been for me. And being a first-time mom, he is being amazing throughout this journey and the stress that we have all had. Amazing is right. A beautiful baby boy, Action Jackson. Hopefully, life gets a little less exciting after this. You've been watching our CBC Vancouver News special coverage on the BC floods. We'll continue to bring you the most important stories of this disaster and talk to those who have been impacted. We're back tomorrow night.